Jess, if you want to start. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, and welcome to February and Black History Month. We are so excited that you're here and looking forward to our discussion today about DEIAB. As you know, DEIAB is way more than just an acronym, standing for diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging. And this is a critical core value and needs to be a practice norm in the workplace. This means creating space where individuals from underserved communities do not face systematic barriers in the workplace. Our team works diligently to assist employers in diversifying their workforce, establishing relationships with local partners, serving diverse talent, and creating workplace cultures that are welcoming to all. We currently have two opportunities for our employers who are interested in joining a consortium of employers across the state on this path through the Diversity and Manufacturing Initiative and the Minnesota Indigenous Workforce Initiative. Check out the chat for contact information if you're interested in learning more about joining as an employer or supporting as a partner in those two efforts. My name is Jessica Miller, and I'm the Director of Workforce Strategy for the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, and we are so happy to have you here with us today. If you're new here, thank you so much for joining us. If you're returning, thank you for joining us again. Take a second and introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you live, what you do for your work, and if there's a service that you provide to employers as well. You'll see on this slide that we have, if you go back one out of Shewa, we have our 24 uh, lineup available for registration. You spoke and we listened. We incorporated your feedback into these topics and we'll continue to weave your needs into our session for the rest of the year. Thank you, ma'am. Our session will go today until 12 p.m., after which we will segue into our 30-minute unplugged portion of the event, where we invite you to turn on your cameras, unmute yourself, and ask questions of our panelists, as well as our team of workforce strategy consultants, verbally or through chat, whatever your preference is. I would also like to take a moment to encourage you to fill out the evaluation at the end of our time here together today. We will get that link popped into the chat probably a few times throughout our time. As always, these webinars are recorded and available to view at any time via YouTube, as well as our CareerForceMN.com website, where you'll find recordings and resources from this session, as well as all of our previous sessions. We will be utilizing our chat feature throughout our time together. Please ask questions, answer questions, interact with our guests, consultants, partners, and each other. We really want to build upon this community that we've started here and welcome your engagement. To kick things off again, let us know where you are, who you are, where you work, and what you would like to learn more about today. Our team of consultants work regionally, which means that each consultant will have a slightly different way that they do their work based on the region and the employers that they're serving in those regions. But the common core ways that we support our employers are identified here on this slide. We work with you to identify gaps in your current strategies, ensure that you're connected with your local, regional, and state workforce partners, and we assist you in building strategies that will help you attract and retain workforce. When you work with us, you are automatically connected to a wide network of people and partners who work collaboratively for the success of our state, our regions, our communities, so that your business and our workforce can thrive. We do not do this work alone, and it takes many people to bring success to these efforts. We have a packed agenda today with some amazing guests who have dedicated their careers to being change makers and culture shakers. And so without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce you to our Metro-based workforce strategy consultant, the fabulous Adeshewa Adesiji. Wow, well, thank you, Jessica. Wow, that was a good introduction. We have to do that more often. Um, but I am a little upset with you because you did steal some of my thunder because I wanted to say hello, everyone, and happy Black History Month. You took that from me. But anyway, welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to today's for, uh, Workforce Wednesday for February. So um, during this session, we'll be talking about DEIAB, once again, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging, and just really thinking, you know, is it time for a, a revamp? You know, has it been overused to the point that it doesn't have, it lost its strength, it lost it, it, its meaning? And so, um, you know, is it now just considered just an acronym um, among a long list of acronyms that's used every day um, when talking about demographics and workforce development and talent development? So, 
So here is our agenda for today's webinar. So we're going to do something a little different with this presentation. So because this is our first time, you guys, audience, bear with us. Um, so of course, the welcome, we already completed that. Um, we're doing also um, a mentee poll. So for anyone who has listened to me present before, I always like to include a question or a quote or a comment to kind of support, you know, the, the uh, purpose of the presentation. So there's not one, but there'll be two questions asked throughout this presentation. Then we'll look at navigating uh, DEIAB in 2024. Um, are we just checking boxes? Um, I'll talk a little bit about allyship, um, performative or effective or regular allyship. Um, then we will go into our lovely panel discussion with three wonderful panelists. Uh, then we will uh, have our second mentee poll. We'll look at the poll results and then we'll conclude um, with a wrap up with some final thoughts. And then we'll go to our Workforce Wednesday Unplugged. As Jessica mentioned, it is those wonderful 30 minutes after the webinar where you, the audience, will be able to ask the panelists um, and or um, our workforce strategy, workforce strategy consultants questions uh, pertaining to today's topic. So with that in mind, let's get to the first question. What word or words, I should say, comes to mind when you think of DEIAB? So I'm going to give people um, a couple of seconds. Um, I believe um, this will also be in the chat. What word or words come to mind when you think of DEIAB? We'll look at those results at the end of the um, presentation. So if someone can put that in the chat, uh, that would be great. But definitely go to Minty put in the code and actually put in those words instead of putting it in the chat. The, the link and the code will be uh, in our chat. Okay, so diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging, um, or DAB. So I'm gonna say, if I say DAB, that's what I mean, um, has gained a lot of attention in the past few years, you know, both positive and negative. You know, first, starting with diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, as we continue to prog progress, focusing on building a stronger workplace for all, then we start looking at accessibility and belonging and how it also fits into this space. You know, however, there has been an increasing challenge for businesses to keep these initiatives active, you know, and at the forefront um, when they, uh, of their strategy development for building their workforce. You know, we hear companies make public comments about their commitment to DIAB, yet the challenge for these businesses is converting comments into tangible actions and results. So we all know that, you know, eventually you have to start, stop talking and actually putting, and actually put actions behind your words. Um, some predict data-driven div DEIAB will be a major trend in 2024, you know, believing the need for hard facts or what we call brass tax accountability. Um, we also can't ignore that there's been pushback um, on these uh, efforts, you know, everywhere, every, everything from uh, Elon Musk declaring that DEI must D-I-E, so DEI must die, uh, to an increase of, you know, lawsuits, potential lawsuits, uh, deeming that um, the work behind DEIAB uh, efforts are discriminatory. So it's basically reverse discrimination. You know, a study from over 600 companies um, for, from workforce analy analytics firm Renvilo Labs reported that diversity, equity, and inclusion officers hired en masse after the protests following George Floyd's murder are now being quietly phased out um, of their positions. So, you know, at the end of the day, DEIAB is still needed in the workplace. And it requires, you know, effort and commitment from everyone in the workplace and the workforce ecosystem. You know, as I said before, actions speak louder than words. Um, it's time to put some actions behind those words, behind those commitments that businesses have mentioned that they're going to be committed to, to, you know, increasing diversity in the workplace. Now it's time to put some actions behind those words. So, you know, the truth is it's easy for employers to check boxes on the DEIAB list. You know, good intentions to increase the diversity of organizations have led to kind of a checkbox approach. 
Um, unfortunately for some, they think that there is no more they need to do. They check the box, they're good. Everything is going to um, basically, you know, even itself out. The challenge is how do we change the attitude from just checking boxes to valuing a diversity of perspective, you know, which requires self-awareness, intellectual flexibility, and knowledge that enables perception of the world through the eyes of others. You know, maintaining just check the box attitude can result in these efforts becoming stagnant and treated more like a tedious task, lessening its importance. So instead of something that someone is passionate to do, oh, it's just something else that I have to do. It's an everyday, it's like drinking water. You know, it's an everyday, we don't think of it. It's it's not um, as important or considered as important, as valuable um, as, you know, people just consider it just more of a task. You know, as companies continue to work towards more diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplaces, it's important not to develop a routine that some companies do of checking those boxes. So, you know, diversity is just more than simply checking boxes to increase representation of the underrepresented. You know, increasing diversity is the first step towards understanding differences and creating equitable opportunities for everyone to grow and contribute to meaningful collaborations within the company. You know, by implementing uh, insincere diversity policies and actions, organizations delay substantive, substantive processes for truly effective change. So, you know, what are some of the things um, to do to, you know, just avoid just checking the boxes? Um, you know, avoid stale and superficial approaches to DEIAB work. You know, encourage conversations beyond checking boxes or making pledges. I know that for some companies, you know, making pledges is big. You know, we want to see that, oh, okay, we're, you know, we want to show and promote that we're making pledges. Well, that should be considered as just checking a box. Um, you're making the pledge, but are you putting actions with, behind those pledges? Uh, welcoming the complexity of diversity. You know, design a process that works for the targeted group, not only the organization. And understanding the challenge is exactly what is desirable. You know, but our companies, you know, are companies being performative or are they really engaging in allyship? You know, are they simply treating DEI policies um, or DEIAB policies as a checkbox and not so much as a real responsibility? So, you know, beyond having a, a seat at the table, you know, and that's one of today's challenges is, is allyship in the workplace and is implementing, you know, these DEIAB initiatives. You know, allyship is described as a lifelong process of building and nurturing supportive relationships with underrepresented, marginalized, or discriminated, discriminated individuals or groups with the aim of advancing inclusion. You know, when we think about allyship, it comes down to two types. You either have performative or effective, um, which is, you know, considered just regular allyship. You know, so what is performative allyship? Performative allyship is often characterized through surface gestures or words. It's the act of outwardly appearing uh, devoted to a cause by declining to take any major actions to support it. Performative allyship does little to advance DEIAB causes leading to actual equity and belonging in the workplace. You know, on the, on the other hand, effective or just plain allyship is that unseen allyship. You know, it characterizes, um, it's characterized by living your life in a way that doesn't reinforce the same oppressive behaviors and systems you claim to be against. So, you know, I think this diagram is a good representation of the difference between performative and effective um, allyship. So, you know, performative allyship um, is represented by the top of the iceberg. You know, it's small, it's cute, it gets into all like the National Ge Geographic magazines. And, and we think that, you know, it re represents the maximum effort or the entire size of, you know, that iceberg. However, that effective allyship, allyship is the reality of the level of efforts needed. Allyship requires long-term engagement and implementation. Effective allyship shows, isn't showcased publicly. publicly. Many times it's the unknown effort. So as you see in this in this um, diagram, you know, the allyship, the iceberg that's not shown, that's where all the, the deep work, you know, the not um, pat on the backs 
that's where that work is. The performative allyship is what is seen, um, you know, kind of that showcase, oh, look what we're doing. So, so what does performative allyship look like? So first, your education stops with social media. So engaging with educators, subject experts, and or reposting, of course, fact-checked uh, educational content. That's an example of performative allyship. You're quick to tweet, but slow to speak. Only ever tweeting or posting about racism or other forms of injustice, but not speaking up when faced with them in your day-to-day -day life or at work, family, or elsewhere. You're looking at external actions only, pointing the finger at everyone else and not looking in the mirror. Allyship is not possible if one is unwilling to do the inner work. Uh, recognizing the need to learn and unlearn uh, certain behaviors. You're centering your voice or are profiting from your allyship. Uh, making, not taking space. Resist the urge to become the savior when it comes to DIAB efforts. Uh, you're expecting a pat on the back or a thank you from those you seek to ally yourself with. Any little positive change um, immediately calls for a need of validation. Actions are seen, seen as a form of charity or even a favor. Uh, you quit as soon as it gets hard. You're challenged on a past, like for example, if you're challenged on a past comment you made or an action you, you did, you know, instead of uh, initiating a talk to explain yourself or a deeper conversation, you switch off. It's getting too hard. I'm being challenged on something I said. Instead of explaining myself, I'm just going to switch off and just totally tune out. So those are ways of, of performative um, allyships. Um, other examples of performative allyships that are not on uh, this list. Um, organizations that might release public statements about diversity during Black History Month or any other month celebrating a marginalized group, but avoid the topic during the other 11 months of the year. You know, organize, organizations that say that they're devoted, devoted to diversity, but neglect to pr promote their BIPOC employees and diversify um, their exter uh, external hiring efforts. So, you know, we all see if we go to a website and a company talks about diversity and you see, you know, they have every representation from every marginalized group, you go to the company and find out that that's literally all of the BIPOC workers that they have, they rounded them all up and said, hey, we want you to take a picture to show diversity. But when you go behind the scenes, it's not as diverse as they say it is. Um, companies putting, uh, for example, uh, during Pride, companies putting rainbows um, on their logos or sponsoring the LGBTQIA2+, I had to do research on that, um, pride parades or anything um, regarding um, uh, pride, but then they might be supporting a cause or supporting someone who actively works to dis diminish uh, the safety and human rights of that community. So um, that's some of the examples of performative um, allyship. So with that, I didn't want to, hope I didn't bore you. Um, I think now let's go to our, our panel discussion and our wonderful panelists. So first, I would like to say hi and introduce James Houston. Uh, James is the owner of Houston Resources, LLC. It's a DEI-focused workforce development consulting firm and a DEI consultant with Excel Energy. So he has more than 15 years experience in DEI work and workforce development in the Twin Cities nonprofits uh, in both the public and private sectors and specializes in new initiatives and pipeline development through engaging external partners. In 2022, um, he was appointed by Governor, Jim, uh, Governor Tim Walz to the State Rehabilitation Council. He currently serves on the board of directors for the Minnesota Black Chamber of Commerce and the Metro State University Alumni Board. He's a proud graduate of Metro State University, uh, and he was recently recognized as the first Emerging Alumni of the Year. Congratulations. Uh, he is a lucky father of two wonderful children and frequently collects and occasionally reads comic books. And he loves giving back to communities who have helped him grow so much as a person and professional throughout his career. So welcome, James. Thank you. 
So next we have the wonderful and beautiful Sonia Simpson. Uh, Sonia has an impressive track record spanning over two decades. So she brings unparalleled expertise in cultivating workforce pathways and pipelines for diverse populations. Her achievement includes the development of a Congress approved best practice training model, now integral, integral to the union, unionized construction industry. Uh, as a visionary founder of Ionis Solutions, a diversity and inclusion employee life cycle cons consultation company, uh, she is passionate about driving uh, positive and international change. Uh, currently, she is the first ever diversity and inclusion director with the Minnesota's legislature. So I do have to read this disclaimer. Uh, her views and opinions expressed during this webinar are solely her own based on her knowledge and background and do not reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Minnesota legislature. She is not representing the Minnesota legislature in any official capacity during this webinar, just her business, Ionis Solutions. So welcome, Sonia. Thank you, Adeshewa, for having me. You are wonderful, a wonderful friend, and thank you, Deed, for having me um, be a part of this discussion. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, we have Jamar Hardy. Uh, Jamar Hardy is the managing broker of Edina Realty Sales Office in, in Minneapolis. Uh, in his nearly two decades in real estate, he has emerged as a leading voice in the industry, particularly in the areas of expanding opportunities for historically underserved communities and housing, real estate careers, and beyond. He's also the director of Edina Realty's Diversity and Inclusion Team, DIT, and is responsible for helping guide the area's largest real estate company into the future with an eye on increasing diversity within each of the 70 plus company offices in Minnesota and Western Wisconsin. He is an active member of the company's recruiting panel and has contributed to a number of corporate initiatives and events, including a guest appearance on Home Services of America's Diversity Matters podcast, where he encouraged people to join the conversation around diversity and inclusion topics. He also is a leader of the industry, having served three years in the Minneapolis Area Realtors Board of Directors, three additional years as a Minneapolis Area Realtors Diversity Chair, and three years on the National Association of Realtors Diversity Committee. He was named 2022 Realtor of the Year and 2024 President for Minneapolis Area Realtors. He's active in his community, community and has served over a decade on the Board of Directors and currently is the board chair of the Link Minnesota, of the Link Minnesota. It's an organization that provides support to at-risk youth in the Twin Cities. So welcome, Jamar. Thanks for having me. All right, so with that, we can get into the panel. All right, so let me pull up my questions for you. So. What I like to do is the first question, just um, this is for everyone. Uh, do you think DEIAB efforts are needed now more than ever? You know, especially when, you know, as I mentioned, there's a lot of pushback about diversity and we don't need diversity. You know, if it's not within the businesses, we've seen it a lot with um, colleges and admissions and, you know, it's all been in the news. And as I mentioned, you know, Elon Musk, who has a huge platform, is talking about D, D-E-I, must D-I-E. Um, so, yeah, do you think that it's needed now more than ever? Um, and if so, why? And I'll open it up to anyone to go ahead and start. I don't. Don't, I like, don't be shy quickly. now. <laughs> Uh, I'll jump in quickly. Um, I, I think it's needed as, as much as it's always been. Um, but I think what's, you know, kind of what's happening with some of the pushback is that uh, coherent strategies are, are what some of the issues are. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I've been doing this work for a long time. Like, I think some of the frustration with DEI as of late is some of it is warranted. Um, and so I think now for people that do this work um, as a profession, um, having coherent strategies um, is going to be what keeps it alive and keeps it productive. Uh, I would agree with that. I think, can everyone hear me? I just want to make sure. <laughs> okay. 
I would agree with that. You know, sometimes I reflect back on the civil rights movement and everything that happened. It's only been 60 years. This is a 60 year celebration of the Civil Rights Act. And when you think about how people think regarding, you know, change, and when you implement something as impactful as the civil rights movement only 60 years ago, I reflect back on how long did it actually take for folks to actually get mobilized? And I'm thinking that there was a, a fair amount of fear after the act was launched that was probably taking place in, you know, 10 to 20 years after that act, right? And so now we're moving farther along into it, right? So I think that if it took a generation of people to actually say, I'm free, maybe, <laughs> I'm free almost, <laughs> uh, to kind of get mobilized and then for the world to see that, you know, um, can we do this? Uh, I think we still have a long time, long, long way to go in implementing uh, DEIAB strategies. I think that that it's very critical to have it and continue to have it because we're just right around the corner of actually seeing this become real at, and actually seeing this to become uh, a normal standard of practice where people are not looking at the color of a skin, the the um, the disabilities of folks that they actually are seeing change and, and reflecting that change and living in that change and moving in that change. So yeah, for, for Elon Musk to say that it must DIE, um, I don't know in what respect he's saying that in. Is he saying that it must DIE because folks out there need to just change or is he saying that it just needs to die because you know it's it's old right so um i think we have a long way to go and uh we have more strides to take and it needs to be actionable yeah yeah and i definitely agree with all that was said here i'll stay kind of in my humble real estate lane and <laughs> you know we're not far removed from the fair housing act um, and it's, you know, little known fact, you know, when you look of, uh, specifically black Americans around home ownership, when you look up, look at how many of them own by a percentage, we had more home ownership for blacks before the fair housing act, uh, than we do now. Right. So yeah. to your point yeah. of the strategies, even coming up now to address a problem that's always been around, um, inequities. Right, especially creating inclusive spaces. I think sometimes we forget about that when we talk about DEI. Um, I think it's needed now because it didn't, you know, it's not working. Like something's not working, right? Something hasn't been worked. And I always unpack it in the real estate lane is when you get to the system being by design, segregation being a thing that people use to, to build wealth. Um, that's why this can't go away. I know we're talking about um, corporations and uh, uh, those halls of privilege speak, because that's why I hear when he says it must die. That's somebody from a privileged <laughs> point of view that doesn't want to put that effort in anymore to do what's right, mm. right? But ultimately, we're still fighting with, with uh, affordability. We're still fighting with things like access to things, right? Um, that this is why this initiative is so important that we keep around because if we just lose it, that gap widens even more, right? Mm -hmm. If we just forget about it and we don't have that allyship, again, that gap widens even more. And we, we're trying to close the gap, bring people more together than pushing them further apart. Thank you. And, and, and I just want to say, um, Jamar, um, I know that you said that you wanted to stay in your real estate <laughs> lane, but I think that what you said can also be applied to, you know, the workforce, you know, the DEIB work is to also provide those opportunities, which would lead to, you know, um, those marginalized groups being able to, to, you know, make a living and to be able to, you know, afford a house of their own. And we all know that, you know, acquiring housing is one of those ways of building wealth and generational wealth. So yes, you said that you wanted to stay in your lane, but you're also talking about things that could be applied to, to workforce as well. And, and James, going back to what you said, you had mentioned, um, and I just forgot, you said uh, that um, 
I totally forgot what I, I it was so good. Is it you know you know when something is so good and then you just forget <laughs> it's that good. Uh, you, uh, I forgot. Well, we'll get back to it. We'll get back okay. to it. Next question. <laughs> so, so what is your thoughts and views? And this is once again open to everyone. You know the thoughts of views views going to um, back to the you know, the situation that we've seen with like um, admissions for colleges and now it's creeping slowly into um, recruiting. You know, there's some people that believe that DEIAB work is is reverse discrimination and it's discriminatory. Uh, <laughs> what would you say to those people that say that, like, you know, uh, I thought we were supposed to get, you know, we're everyone is supposed to be inclusive and equal and, you know, focusing on this work is now you're alienating you know, other groups of people. And yes, it could be look at reverse discrimination. What is your your, your thoughts, your response to that? Mm-hmm. Sonia, I, I think see you shake I your think... head first. I want you to go first. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, thank you for sometimes the questions ahead of time, because it actually makes us, you know, get right to the point, right? And of yeah. course, with me, I always take notes. So um, I wrote down, and I'm not going to read it, read it, you know how I am. But DIAB is not a discrimination against any particular group, but rather a, a, a way to level the playing field, right? <laughs> um, so when we talk about reverse discrimination, um, we're talking about systemic biases and inequities, right? And so I just believe that there's... I don't believe in reverse discrimination. <laughs> I believe that there are, there's privileges that were um, enacted prior to us even gaining our freedom and success um, or those freedoms and successes being ripped away from us, like as in the case of Tulsa and, you know, in New York and North Carolina and those kind of places. Um, and I just believe that we're just trying to level that playing ground. We should address those those claims with reverse discrimination by asking about, you know, their concerns, trying to help to unpack those concerns, right? Trying to help them understand those folks that consider reverse discrimination a thing um, and that it's real. And for those people that are thinking that we're taking away something that's prized, a prized possession, uh, to help them to understand the disparities that have happened along the lines and in age and then engage in open uh, conversation, constructive dialogue to address misconceptions. Um, I, I just read an article recently uh, about uh, reverse discrimination with farmers that were given, um, that were actually upset because there's been a grant that's allowed for people of color uh, that want to farm. And they're saying, I could not access this funding because of the color of my skin, right? And mostly white. Um, And I just felt saddened because I just feel like, hasn't that always been the market? Hasn't that always been something that you've been able to access is opportunity? Uh, bank loans, uh, those types of things, um, anything really, and why not be able to share that space, right? So I, I, I think that we have a lot of work to do and we have a lot of unpacking to do as well as helping people to unlearn. And sometimes you just can't help certain people to unlearn. Thank you. Anyone mm-hmm. else? Uh, I can go on. I'll, I'll say I'll. <clears throat> I think about this like personally and as a professional. Um, I think that personally, I I don't necessarily believe that DEI in and of itself is reverse discrimination. As a professional, I will say that not everybody who has this title, uh, not everybody who does this work, does it well. You know, and that's the reality of uh, DEI. And I think that there are some spaces where. You know, when when George Floyd was murdered, companies panic, you know, there was a a 50 million jobs out there for people to do DEI consulting or DEI directors. And a lot of people got hired into this space that that had passion, 
uh, that had passion, but maybe not an understanding of how the work should be done, uh, maybe not a strategy going into it. And so I think, you know, over the past couple of years, there probably has been some spaces where people are using DEI in ways that aren't there to advance everybody, you know? And I think I understand the, the idea behind it is that, you know, we're leveling the playing field for uh, marginalized populations, absolutely. But I think in a space where you're working, you know, like in my case, you know, I work for a Fortune 500 company, um, DEI has to cover everybody, you know, um, and I can't leave anybody out uh, because if I do leave people out, um, we get that pushback and that's not something that allows me to function properly in my job. And so while I, I don't think it, that it's reverse discrimination, but I think it's possible to discriminate in this space, you know, like um, one of the one of the letters in the acronym is accessibility. And as someone who's you know worked in spaces where I've served people with disabilities my whole life, I can assure you, even in the best of circumstances, people with disabilities are left behind. Um, yeah. You know, even with the most well-intentioned folks, including myself, I mean, my own company, um, dis people with disabilities are often an afterthought. And so, I think that it's important to recognize that if you do this work that you are thinking of everybody you know yes there are going to be detractors you know there's going to be bad actors and and naysayers and things like that uh, but the reality is is that it is here for everybody and and when you're getting pushback especially when you're getting legitimate pushback it's important to reflect on the work that you're doing you know uh, and if you find that you're doing things that are out of step with the principles of you know this work then fix it you know if it's just someone who's whining about it because they're not getting you know, the the same access to funding or, you know, they're just feeling hurt because, you know, someone else is being called out or singled out. And that's that's a different thing. But it is important to be mindful that, you know, there's ethics behind this work, there's principles behind the work. And it's not just, a you know, you have to keep that in mind when doing it or else it's not DEI. And Ada Shewa, can I jump in? Because I'd like to comment about James. Um comment actually <laughs> you had mentioned earlier you said some people actually got into this DEI space during a time where they were passionate about it and it was true that's true I, I somewhat agree with that because the tone of diversity and inclusion is changing now from just training where you're checking the box um, and into more actionable processes, right? That's something that I lean towards. Like, what is the action behind that change? A policy movement. What is the action that we're embedding in DEI around our um, A benefits book? What are those actions behind that? And what are the what is that training that's going to solidify the actions when we change policy practices and those kind of things? It used to be a check the box. I, you know, I'm just going to, you know, train you on what is diversity, what is inclusion, what is <laughs> belonging. And I think that that you can find that relatively anywhere now. But how do we take that deeper dive? Right. And I think that's the that's the thing that I'm feeling in the atmosphere right now is, um, you know, D DEI had a purpose. I believe Sherm just wrote an article about the fact that um, about the fact that DEI was a check the box and now what is it today? And they're trying to think about and consider what can it be, right? And so if we don't get down to the nitty gritty <laughs> and really get to the point to where we, you know, you can take offense and let's then unpack that offense and then let's see where we land from that. I think we don't move the dial. I think the dialogue must be stronger. And I think that you you must uh, be an advocate within the space where you're getting people to really um, challenge their own thought process and their thinkings. So, so <clears throat> thank you, James, for that. Because I, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I want to add this too, because I think 
<laughs> when you think of DEI, I think race is the first thing people go to. The yeah. colorism behind it is mm -hmm. the first thing people lean into. That's when we really start segregating ourselves in this conversation. My experience with DEI is about my upbringing and 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 my community. And sometimes it's bathed in in religion too, right? And what my strong beliefs are there versus the reality of the communities that we're in right now and how they've gotten set up the way that they are. So I think within these principles, there's education that needs to be unpacked and unearthed as well, because trust me, the things we're talking about today weren't taught to us in school <laughs> for the majority of us on this call here, right? And we're, 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 we don't want our kids to know about our deep, dirty secret, but yet we're leaving this behind for them. So if we're not doing the work now to unpack all that in our current status, then we're leaving something even much yeah. worse than we received uh, when we grew up, right? So yeah. I think strip the color away. It's really a social economics conversation and everybody fits in that bucket. And that's where I see the, again, that gap getting bigger is, you know, they say the haves and has nots, right? There's really no middle class anymore, right? And I think a lot of companies have used DEI strategies to help perpetuate that instead of really adding perspective around why are we so separated? Why are opportunities not giving to all at the same rate, right? And why aren't we being intentional in our efforts to make sure we're getting different perspectives at the tables, especially when we talk about policy um, changes, those policy changes are supposed to help certain under marginalized communities, but we don't have members from those communities a part of those conversations. Mm -hmm. So that's really when you start going deep on this work why this is so important, but also why we need to be honest around why we need this. Yeah, and and I don't think it should go into the like you said. We've got a legacy that we're leaving, and they we'd like for that legacy to actually be successful. So in order to to help that legacy along, we can't wait for the Gen Zs to come in and say, "Hey, we got it under control." We have to continue <laughs> to do the work. Uh, and the good work is what I call it in order to affect change. Um, and again, out of shape, well, I'm not trying to take over your. <laughs> no, your this session, is good. But... This is good. This is what I want. <laughs> Continue. I, I, well, let me just say this from this conversation alone, I've come up and I've been writing some notes down. I have like five new questions. So, no, <laughs> continue. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> No, so I, I think that this is really, really good, and I, I don't, I think that we, sh it should be more relevant. I don't think it should be. We should be in that arena of trying to help people understand what's diversity and inclusion. We should actually tie it to actionable processes and get people to act. And 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 um, you know, one one bright note in this is when I was reading as well that at least 73 percent of companies and organizations are still in alignment with DNI DEI efforts and I really appreciate that but um, I don't know what that what it was before <laughs> so maybe we're just still at the same place but at least 73 percent of companies are still doing this work and dedicated to it. Now, what the dedication is, is another story. Because as you had mentioned, performative and effective, we could be performative dedication <laughs> as opposed to effective dedication, right? Um, so that's a whole nother story. <laughs> so, no, this is, oh my God, this is, I, I wish we had more time, like more than, than just an hour. Um, so I have a follow-up question um, just about the reverse discrimination. So. How should businesses approach maybe some of their staff, you know, from entry to C-suite that might have, you know, if, if, if they're trying to um, implement um, a DEIAB strategy, you know, how can they approach that pushback from within? That is reverse discrimination where, you know, Jamar, you said, you know, it, it's not, it. we always focus on race first. It's not technically that focus. Sometimes it's, you know, other focuses within that. Um, you know, how, how do you think a, a business should approach uh, getting that feedback internally? Or that you know, I, pushback, sorry. No, I, I so I, I think it's always about being comfortable having this conversation and providing spaces to do it. I think 
what companies don't do, or I'll say what they do well, is they uh, leave it up to an exec to fill the tough calls. They have a crisis hotline. They send people to HR when really they should be creating spaces for everybody to get together and have conversations. I'm not talking about conversations to complain, but conversations to collaborate, right? How can we make our spaces more um, uh, welcoming, inclusive, right? How can we do things? And, and, and mind you not, I don't think it's something you just do on an annual basis. I think it's something you make efforts to do um, and you don't do it by, uh, we're going to take the young folks and put them over here. We're going to take the two-year people and put them over there. It's inviting everybody to the table to have these conversations on a regular basis, right? So you understand what your community, even with your incorporation, really needs, right? And then understand the traumas that people bring from outside into the companies is something that you need to give support to as well. Because if I may sing, I was raised by a single mother, you know, and there wasn't enough time to be at home with me to help understand what I had to do for homework. That got passed on to my sisters. She had to work multiple jobs. But how are you rating her performance based on the traumas that she's bringing in as well? Mm -hmm. Right. How are you giving her the support that she needs to make sure, you know what, you have a couple extra days off here because I understand that you're doing it all alone. I just don't think there's enough. Um, digging deeper into who we're supporting within our companies, i.e. communities, to really understand how we can make everybody feel like they're welcome and included. It's one thing, again, <laughs> I've, I've heard this analogy all the time, it's one thing to invite somebody to the party, but are you asking them to dance, right? Or are you allowing them to be in the room by themselves saying, hey, I stand out, but nobody wants to dance with me. Nobody's invited me on the dance floor. Even though I'm quite qualified to get in that front door, you know, uh, but yet nobody's asking me to dance as well. So I think it's, again, providing more spaces for people to be feel supported and then really identifying what your community around support looks like. Mm -hmm. So there was a question. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah. There's a question um, actually from one of my counterparts. Um, he had asked the audience, um, does any companies in the audience use employee resource groups or ERGs. So I know that a lot, a lot of companies have ERGs. Do you think that they can be an asset or a liability when, you know, thinking about, you know, keeping DEIAB alive? You know, James, you had mentioned um, not everyone in this space is doing it well. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> is employee resource groups, why I, I like the idea of employee resource groups, Having one, is that just another check the box? We have an employee resource group and we're good? Or do you think, um, I guess, you know, should there be more beyond having employee resource groups? So if I'm a company and I'm small and I, and, and I want to uh, develop an employee resource group, we've been there, did that. Like, what's the next, like, what what should that company do to make sure that it's actually adding value to the overall goal of DEIAB? In, the, in that company? Well, I, I think you just made the point, you know, the, the company has to make sure that they add value. Um, you know, we have at, at Excel Energy, we have business resource groups. The, the purpose of our groups is to add value to the business. Um, obviously, they get together and network and have some social aspects of what they do. But just as an example, uh, the Pride Alliance, which is our BRG that's focused on the LGBTQ community, um, they, <clears throat> Over the past couple of years, um, some of the initiatives that they started off is, um, you know, they're the reason that we get 100% score on the Human Rights Commission survey. Um, we also, um, they're also the group that added um, transition benefits um, to the company, you know, and so if you if you have ERGs, <laughs> if you Sorry, I'm getting a lot of emails about LinkedIn. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you have ERGs, if you have ERGs and BRGs um, that are focused on diverse groups, yes, you know, they, they need to add value to the work that you're doing. I mean, that would be the whole purpose. And I think that would be part of the purpose. I think people would join, you know, to, to have more of a say, to get together with like-minded individuals, to, to help improve aspects of the business, <laughs> especially along those lines of, of the community they represent. Um, and so we got 14 BRGs at, at Excel Energy, um, you know, women, we got a vets group, we have a group for young people, uh, we have a group for women in nuclear, very specific 
Um, and what they do is they help, you know, provide value to the business by doing recruiting, um, mm-hmm. looking at policy changes that we need to make, um, giving back to the community. So for our day of service events, they do things like that. Um, so I don't I don't think it's just enough to have an ERG. I mean, I think that's nice for the individuals, but you know, if you can add some value uh, to to what the company is doing, then that's where that's where those folks in that space can contribute to having better DEI at the company. All right. Uh, anyone else want to elaborate, add, or did Mr. Houston pretty much say everything that needs to be said on that? <laughs> I think sometimes people uh, ask, why is there a difference between all of these groups? Like there's an ERG, there's a BRG, and then there's an affinity group, right? I think people are moving away from affinity groups. But, and James, maybe you you know the difference between this, you know, between the three. Like, what's the difference? I think I know what it is. But um, why would a company align themselves to an ERG as opposed to a BRG or vice versa? I I mean, I think in our case, um, in our case, we wanted groups to add value to the business and not that ERGs don't, uh, but the specific role of our BRGs is to do that. You know, obviously there's a cultural aspect and networking aspect to it, uh, but we give them budget. You know, we give them budgets so they have money that they can spend on certain initiatives. Um, They used to sponsor different groups, but we moved that to the foundation. But there is a purpose, you know, they're they're there to inform the company on how we move forward on certain things. And I mean, again, like I think the Human Rights Commission survey is something that a lot of companies fill out. But. I don't know that we would have taken those steps without getting nudged from our Pride Alliance group. You know, um, you know, the transition surgery benefits are something that a lot of companies are looking at. But without that group of people doing the research, you know, getting the information, meeting with the benefits team, meeting with leaders, and going through that entire process, having a strategy <laughs> of how to complete an actionable item, uh, we probably wouldn't have them. You know. And so I think that's the, to me, that's the big difference between BRGs and ERGs is that ERGs can do networking, you know, and give back to the community and things like that. And all that is fantastic stuff. But the BRGs, I think, is just, a, I don't want to say another level, but an added intention, an added intention to to serve the business specifically along those lines. So basically, it can serve both internal and external with BRGs as opposed to ERGs are more internal. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Right. Honestly, I don't know why I'm here, but okay. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I, for the audience, both Sonia, James Houston, and I, I go way back with both of them. So we can have that type of conversation. <laughs> um, so, so we're almost at the end. We have one more uh, mentee poll, and then um, we want to uh, look at the results. And then I want to get your guys' feedback on the results of the poll. But um, you had mentioned, Sonia, um, you know, DEIAB work, you know, it, it comes down to what it is now versus what it can be. And so, um, you know, how can companies? remain passionate and energetic and in just really active when it comes to that DEIAB work. So then you can look back and say it was in this place or in this space in the beginning, but now it's here. And hopefully the here is, you know, a positive uh, uh, you know, something positive versus something negative. But yeah, how can how can companies remain passionate? I think with and uh, I'm sorry, and this is for everyone too. So okay, <laughs> yeah. I think I think um, when you are in this role of diversity and inclusion uh, director, executive, chief, whatever you want to call it, I think that you must look at longevity. You definitely need to understand what is your mission and your vision. And for diversity and inclusion, not for the company, but for diversity and inclusion. And from that vision, you start to begin to look at what could potentially be the impact 
statements or how do we measure impact, both qualitative and quantitative, right? And if you do that, then you can begin to un, you can begin to see what are the first phases that need to be launched, and then how do we measure that, and what is the second phase, third phase? Maybe maybe it's a five-year plan in your strategy, and over that course of time, it's a build process, because things will change, things will evolve if you have the right people in place. And I have to say, I have to go back to leadership. Leadership must own this work, and not to the point to where it's um, uh, what was it that you called allyship again? Because I'm missing performative, words. Effective. Yes, and yeah. not performative, not because you want the world to see that you are diverse, and because of that, you know, we get some kind of kudos. We're talking about actual effective work, meaning that we want our leaders to unpack their biases, um, and we want our leaders to understand what diversity and inclusion is. We want our leaders to set the tone. We need our leaders to be on top of it at all times and be in partnership with your DNI folks, right? And all of your ERGs and your BRGs and those types of things be a part of those initiatives. So, with that being said, I believe that that's what keeps it alive because as we are realizing in today's industry, things are changing all the time. Every time I read new articles, I've heard of something new from the Supreme Court's judgment of, you know, we're, we're no longer going to be recruiting for diverse candidates into our schooling system. And now that paradigm shift where there's uh, organizations that are out there thinking about how do we now get DNI off DEI off the table, right? And there are folks that are fighting against that. We have to be nimble enough to understand change and be nimble enough to start looking at those um, different identities. It wasn't too far along, far, too far away when you included the A in DEI. It was DEI now, and then it became B, DEI B. Now it's DEI A B. What is it going to be? two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you have to be able to morph, change, learn, and grow. That's all that we're asking everyone to do and be anyway, right? So that's how you can keep it relevant. Kind of look at that perspective of it's not a one and done thing. You can't have just a strategy where it's just one and done. You have to continue to look at the progression and the process. Thank you. So we have just a, mm -hmm. a, a few, like a minute left. Um, Jamar, James, any uh, additional comments? Or did Sonia speak for the panel? <laughs> you know, I, 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 think, I, I think she spoke well. I, I think real quick, if, if I can sum it up, you know, I think for a lot of, of our Fortune 100, 500 companies here in the state of Minnesota, we have to really unpack the reason, like we attract a lot of diverse talents, especially from universities throughout our great land, but the candidates never stay. So really getting to why people don't stick and stay around here, I think, you know, i.e. the Minnesota nice, like we need to be more honest about what that's about as well, um, yeah. to keep our initiatives going forward. <laughs> Thank you. James, 10 no, seconds, go. No, what's up? <laughs> yeah, no, she knocked it out of the park. I'm good. <laughs> okay. So with that, I want to get to the last um, question of the pan of the um of our discussion. So let me pull this back up. And then we'll go to the results real quick. Give me a quick second. All right, so after hearing the wonderful panelists in this wonderful discussion, what words, I didn't change this either, what words or word comes to now comes to mind when you think of DEIAB? So once again, go to menti.com, you put in the code and you could put in your word or words that now come to mind when you think of this acronym. I'll give you a couple of seconds and then we'll go and we'll see what the results are for both of the questions.
OK, so let's go. All right, so I believe everyone can still see my screen. So this was the first one. What words came to come to mind when you think of DEIAB? So um, according to the results from the audience, uh, we have um, the words that came up the most, of course, are the biggest. So we have important, we have inclusion, we have belonging, diversity. I see buzzword. That one uh, is a surprise to me, but um, important in, in inclusion seem to be the top two um, words that come up when you when in the beginning when people thought of uh, DEIAB. Now let's look at the second result. Give me a second. OK, so what words now come to mind when you think of DEIAB? So now we have inclusion is still there, but we have equity. We have justice. We have action. So those are some of the bigger words. So um, just the last last quick, quick thought, because I know that we're officially over time. Um, what, are, what is the panelists thoughts on the words that came up when we first asked the question compared to um, to what they see now when we had asked it again and we asked now what do what now what comes to mind uh, any last minute co comments or thoughts on that i'm going to say action i think from the first one to now uh, i didn't see action in the beginning but um action it's time to work it's time to do yes um jamar or james um, what you're talking about what words stood out? Yeah, just what stood out between, you know, what the difference between what you saw um, <clears throat> the first the, with the first results compared to the second. So I said, yeah, you know, I, yeah go ahead. Yeah, I guess I, I would agree. Uh, action. Um, I guess I, I I'm all I also noted the the buzzword from the first one. Um, and yeah, I think I think those are the two that the ones the the ones that I noticed. Uh, it's just you know the the work itself is in such an interesting space right now, um, and I and I am I appreciate for one that people are being critical of how it functions in in workspaces because if we are critical and we do challenge how we do this work, then to me that only makes it better in the long run. Um, and so, like, I just I appreciate having these kind of conversations and, and hearing from all sides of people. But yeah, the buzzword one in action are the ones that stick out to me. And Jamar. Uh, well, I'd like them too. I, I, I noticed that, you know, one word uh, went uh, um, from importance to, you know, another buzzword, if you will. Um, so I, you know, so I do think in foundation of the work, everybody uh feels that the DEI principles uh, are still important to have. Mm -hmm. Great. So with that, we are officially done. I want to thank Miss Sonia Simpson, Mr. Jamar Hardy, and Mr. James Houston. This was a wonderful conversation. I wish we could go longer, but of course we can't. We're actually over time. So I'm going to hand this over to my counterpart in Northeast Minnesota, Shayla Drake, who will talk about next month's Workforce Wednesday. Yes. So next month, be sure to join us um, for our next Workforce Wednesday, where we're going to be talking about navigating um, the new American workforce. That's going to be on Wednesday, March 6th, same time frame from 11 to noon with an unplugged session following from noon to 12:30 so registration is open so be sure to stick around afterwards similar to this one for the 12 to 12:30 where we're going to be able to um unplugged and ask questions um so we'll go ahead and move to the next